Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Kat. So I've been doing the case studies on medical science liaisons for the last two episodes and this will be the final finale of the show. Um, I have three more cases um, to show with you, three of my friends. <laughs> so they have different degrees um, other than PhD, um, of course they have advanced degrees and I hope you know they can provide you a different perspectives other than coming from a scientist's background. I hope this video can address some of your questions regarding to if you have a farm or MD and don't forget to like my videos and subscribe to my channel. Let's get started. Well, first of all, my friend Alice. So she's a Chinese in the United States right now, but she got her medical degree uh, back in China. Well, it's a medical doctorate degree because there's a big confusion uh, among Chinese MDs because uh, in China, the system is you go to the college as a medical school, okay? So for example, a brief background in the United States and many other countries, you go to college for four years and then you go to medical school, okay, for another four years. So total eight years and then you get your medical doctor degree, okay? So in China, um, something different and some other countries as well is you basically, uh, after high school, you decide if you want to go to medical school or other college. So for example, Alice, uh, in this case, she went to the medical school, right, during the college, and then the medical school is typically five years, and then you get a medical degree. And medical degree, <laughs> the abbreviation or initial of it is MD, right? So a lot of Chinese coming to the United States after five years of medical college, after getting their medical degree, they will say, oh, I'm an MD. Okay, but they are technically not the medical doctorate degree. Okay, so that's a, the clarification there. So in China, basically after these five years, you can become a doctor. Like it is a medical degree, right? So you can practice being a doctor in China. However, you know, it's not, you know, the, the best degree, uh, you know, as a doctorate. So you could pursue uh, the master and doctorate in the medical field for another three to five years. And then you basically become, you know, a, a actual medical doctorate degree, um, a do an actual doctor. And then you, it, it's just going to be easier for you to get promoted within the hospital or, you know, later become the dean, become different titles. Typically it requires uh, the actual doctorate medical degree okay but anyway so many chinese come out um claiming they're mds but they're not actual mds so, but my friend alice she is actually okay an md holding a medical doctorate degree after she got the um, the medical degree she realized maybe there could be something else so she actually uh went to a large pharmaceutical company become a scientist so the reason for that is during her medical doctorate degree, she also worked in a lab. So she was actually really interested in research, okay? So that's why she had hands-on experience plus her clinical experience landed her a job at a large pharmaceutical company uh, in the United States, actually. So she worked there as a scientist for a couple of years. And then she decided to move forward to more a medical affairs side of the job. So she become a medical um, affair fellow and um, continued doing the clinical side, regulatory side of the drug development. So afterwards, it, you know, very smoothly, um, she transitioned to a medical science liaison and the medical affair director afterwards. So it is a quite different path, I would say, you know, than all the other cases I've shared so far. But I think this provided a valuable lesson for international students who wanna, you know, stay in the United States and transition to a medical science liaison job, but they got their degree abroad, right? You know, you probably from India, you probably from China, you probably from, you know, many other countries that maybe has a less advantage compared to people who have advanced degree from the United States, right? So what you can do is you could start from 
a smaller company or um, a different job in the big company that you want to have the MSL job with. So being in that company or being just in the industry in general uh, have several advantages, right? So first, you expand your network. You know people from the company, you know people, you know MSLs within that company that you want to be one of them, right? You make friends with them, you know how they get there, right? That's really important because later on, you can actually tailor experience trying to work with them. You know, that's a lot of um, interpersonal skills that you, you will gain and you will you know, also apply later on for the job. Gaining industrial experience also help you, you know, build your resume on top of communication skills, project management skills, and everything Tony talked about and I've been talking about in my past few videos, right? So those soft skills really can gain through those jobs, right? It doesn't have to be a MSLs. It can be anything else as I've said repeatedly, okay? Well, so this is Alice, um, quite unique, but I think give us a different angle to look at how to break into the MSL. Well, my next uh, example is also quite unique. Her name is Helen. Um, Helen, actually, she's a second generation immigrant. So her parents immigrated to the United States and then so she's, she was born here. So uh, she's a native speaker. She pursued a medical degree in the United States after her college, okay? As I just walked you through how the medical school works here. And then she actually very interested, you know, still um, want to be a doctor. So she um, did her residency after medical school and then she became a fellow and then she actually, you know, started her clinical path, you know, afterwards. At the same time, she was also a clinical professor at the medical school she graduated from, okay? At the same time, she also has an MPH degree in public policy. So, um, more and more I realize that policy is a quite unique field that many of my MSL friends have experience with. You know, even actually one or two of people that I know from my current company in consulting also have the policy background. So working with policy, you also know, right, right, regulatory part of the healthcare. So I think that definitely helps. So she also has the MPH from there. Um, and then after two years being a clinical professor and a doctor, uh, she decided to move towards MSL job. And then, you know, with her such in-depth clinical backgrounds plus you know she was at clinical faculty and it was relatively easy for for her to get a job and soon she was promoted to a medical director so this is a quite right different path and i you know this this episode is full of unique cases right so uh but all i'm trying to say is there are so many different ways to be a msl right and just like Greg from the last video that even you're a professor, if you're a faculty, you can totally choose a different career path. It's never too late to get there, okay? As long as you're happy with your job, right? So we're going to Helen, you know, she's quite happy with her current job. She still do some of the part-time actually in a private practice as a doctor. So, you know, you can have a hybrid mode of the job right now. It's a it's a time that you don't just work on a job for 40 years and retire, right? Uh, now you can have multiple jobs, you have side hustles, multiple job is not, you know, you're trying to struggle with your life. That's why you have to have multiple jobs. It's just more like, you know, there are so many different fields you're interested in, you, so you just work on different titles and that's just awesome, right? Yeah, so that's Helen. And then we have finally Joyce. So Joyce has a PharmD um, and I think I got a few comments about, you know, I'm pursuing a PharmD or I'm going to pursue an advanced degree and I want to be an MSL, should I do a PharmD? So PharmD is very interesting because it requires fewer commitments time-wise. Of course, it's, it's quite difficult, right? <laughs> the pharmacology and everything, yeah, just, just think about it may my head spin. For people who are really interested in pharmacology and maybe being a pharmacist could be another path, so you decide to go to 
uh, a pharmacy school, get a farm day afterwards, that's completely fine, right? You know how drug works, awesome. So for Joyce, she got her farm D, and then, you know, actually it is quite difficult to be a pharmacist in the United States because, you know, there are limited jobs at pharmacy, for example, you know, at CVS or Walgreens that you see in the corners of your street. You know, they're limited spots, right? Like one pharmacy probably only have one or two pharmacists. So it's actually quite difficult for, you know, so many pharmacy school graduates to get a pharmacist. So actually Joyce didn't really initially want to be an MSL. It's more like she couldn't find a job as a pharmacist. So she actually joined a large healthcare system and became a clinical pharmacy specialist. You know, the title didn't matter, but you know, something leveraged her degree and working in a healthcare system, okay? That's what matters. It's like the clinical trial coordinator, right? It doesn't really matter the title, but as long as you're involved in the clinical trial space, that could add experience for your future MSL job. But at that time, she didn't, you know, think that she wanna be a MSL down the line. So she just thought, you know, this is a great opportunity and she can work on that. And, you know, within the job, you know, definitely because it's a healthcare system. So she was in contact with the patients, in contact with the physicians, a lot of communication and project management skills, right? And moreover, when you're working in such big healthcare system, you actually um, could, right, if you want, I mean, everything's about you being proactive. So she served in certain committees and then she drafted and designed and helped other people on the policy writing. So that's, you know, tied into what I just said, right? Like policy wise. So by doing all of these, she really understand the regulatory um, side of the clinical space. And then that really helped, right, later on, basically, well, so she worked uh, quite a long time in this healthcare system. And later on, she think it's a good time to move on. So she decided to move into the MSL space. So it was quite a, you know, comparably different move, right? But, you know, she had a lot of experience within the healthcare system in a clinical space. This really helped her, you know, to get an MSL job later on, you know, when she's now an MSL, she can talk to the physicians very in depth on the drug mechanisms and about patient management, a lot of things that she can contribute on the MSL job. So she got the job fairly easily and now she's also, you know, very happy about the job. So. It's a very also like a very different uh, case, but I just want to share with you that there are all different kind of ways to get to your ideal job. So now we are talking about MSL, but it could be completely something different. But several key lessons from all these three great women that I know, they all get into the MSL relatively later in their life, right? Uh, or when they're like, you know, late 30s and 40s. Secondly, you know, they were all amazing professionals in their previous job, right? No matter if you're a pharmacist or you're a scientist or doctor, you know, they were doing completely fine and they were brave enough to make the transition, right? That's just something that I really appreciate and I see in people's life and I'm, I'm really happy for them. So of course, I'm not sure how much this could apply to you, but I think if you keep in mind, appreciate any experience to gain those soft skills and get closer to, uh, you know, the clinical space if you want to get into MSL, network, know people, that's all you need. You know, you will get there someday. And as Tony said, you know, patience, persistence is also the key. I hope you really enjoyed this video. This is the finale, as I said, of my series. If you would like to hear more, please comment below, let me know. Um, so I could do very similar things for, you know, the consulting or other uh, career path if you're looking into. So if you like such content, please thumb up and subscribe to my channel. And thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video.